Chapter 9 of The Complete Book of Cheese. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Stearns. The Complete Book of Cheese by Robert Carlton Brown. Chapter 9 Au Gratin, Soups, Salads, and Sauces. He who says au gratin says parmesan. Thomas Gray, the English poet, saluted it two centuries ago with Parma, the happy country where huge cheeses grow. On September 4th, 1666, Pepys recorded the bearing of his pet parmesan, as well as my wine and some other things, in a pit in Sir W. Batten's garden. And on the selfsame 4th of September, more than a century later, in 1784, Woodford, in his diary of a country parson, wrote, I sent Mr. Custom's about three dozen more of apricots, and he sent me back another large piece of fine Parmesan cheese. It was very kind of him. The second most popular cheese for Ogratin is Italian Romano, and, for an entirely different flavor, Swiss Sapsago. The French, who gave us this cookery term, use it in its original meaning for any dish with a browned topping, usually of bread crumbs or crumbs and cheese. In America, we think of au gratin as grated cheese only, although, Webster says, with a browned covering, often mixed with butter or cheese, as potatoes au gratin. So, let us begin with that. Potatoes au gratin. Two cups diced cooked potatoes, two tablespoons grated onion, half cup grated American cheddar cheese, two tablespoons butter, half cup milk, one egg, salt, pepper, more grated cheese for covering. In a buttered baking dish, put a layer of diced potatoes, sprinkle with onion and bits of butter. Next, scatter on a thin layer of cheese and alternate with potatoes, onions, and butter. Stir milk, egg, salt, and pepper together and pour it on the mixture. Top everything with plenty of grated cheese to make it authentically American or gratin. Bake until firm in moderate oven about half an hour. Eggs au gratin. Make a white sauce, flavored with minced onion, to pour over any desired number of eggs broken into a buttered baking dish. Begin by using half of the sauce and sprinkling on a lot of grated cheese. After the eggs are in, pour on the rest of the sauce, cover it with grated cheese and breadcrumbs, drop in bits of butter, and cook until brown in oven, or about twelve minutes. Tomatoes au gratin. Cover bottom of shallow baking pan with slices of tomato and sprinkle liberally with bread crumbs and grated cheese. Season with salt, pepper, and dots of butter. Add another layer of tomato slices, season as before, and continue this, alternating with cheese, until pan is full. Add a generous topping of crumbs, cheese, and butter. Bake 50 minutes in moderate oven. Onion soup au gratin. Four or five onions sliced. Four or five tablespoons butter. One quart stock or canned consomme. One quart bouillon made from dissolving four or five cubes. Rounds of toasted French bread. One and a half cups grated Parmesan cheese. Saute onions in butter in a roomy saucepan until light golden and pour the stock over. When heated, put in a larger casserole, add the bouillon, season to taste and heat to boiling point. Let simmer fifteen minutes and serve in deep, well-heated soup plates, the bottoms covered with rounds of toasted French bread, which have been heaped with freshly grated parmesan, and browned under the boiler. More cheese is served for guests to sprinkle on as desired. At gala parties, where wine flows, a couple of glasses of champagne are often added to the bouillon. In the famed onion soup au gratin at Le Hall in Paris, grated gruyere is used in place of parmesan. They are interchangeable in this recipe. American Cheese Soups In this era of fine canned soups, a quick cheese soup is made by heating cream of tomato soup, ready-made, and adding finely grated Swiss or Parmesan to taste. French bread, toasted and topped with more cheese and broiled golden, makes the best base to pour this over, as is done with the French onion soup above. The same cheese toasts, on the basis of a simple milk cheese soup, with heated milk poured over 
in a seasoning of salt, pepper, chopped chives, or a dash of nutmeg. Chicken Cheese Soup Heat together one cup milk, one cup water, in which two chicken bouillon cubes have been dissolved, and one can of condensed cream of chicken soup. Stir in a quarter cup grated American cheddar cheese, and season with salt, pepper, and plenty of paprika until cheese melts. Other popular American recipes simply add grated cheese to lima bean or split bean soup, peanut butter soup, or plain cheese soup with rice. Imported French marmites are de rigueur for real onion soup or gratin, and an imported parmesan grinder might be used for freshly ground cheese. In preparing, it is well to remember that they are basically only melted cheese melted from the top down. Cheese Salads When a Frenchman reaches the salad, he is resting and in no hurry. He eats the salad to prepare himself for the cheese. Henri Charpentier, Life à la Henri Green Cheese Salad Julienne Take and dive watercress and as many different kinds of crisp lettuce as you can find and mix well with provolone cheese cut in thin julienne strips and marinated three to four hours of French dressing. Crumble over the salad some blue cheese and toss everything thoroughly with plenty of French dressing. American Cheese Salad Slice a sweet ripe pineapple thin and sprinkle with shredded American cheddar. Serve on lettuce dipped in French dressing. Nut and Cheese Salad Mix American cheddar with an equal amount of nut meats and enough mayonnaise to make a paste. Roll these in little balls and serve with fruit salads, dusting lightly with finely grated sapsago. Brie or Camembert Salad Fill ripe pear or peach halves with creamy imported brie or camembert, sprinkle with honey, serve on lettuce drenched with French dressing, and scatter shredded almonds over. Cream cheese will do in a pinch. If the camembert isn't creamy enough, mash it with some sweet cream. Three in one mold. Three quarters cup cream cheese, half cup grated American cheddar cheese, half cup Roquefort cheese crumbled, two tablespoons gelatin dissolved and stirred into half cup boiling water, juice of one lemon, salt, pepper, two cups cream beaten stiff, half cup minced chives. Mash the cheeses together, season gelatin liquid with lemon, salt and pepper, and stir into cheese with the whipped cream. Add chives last, Put in ring mold or any mold you fancy. Chill well and slice a table to serve on lettuce with a little mayonnaise or plain. Swiss Cheese Salad Dice half pound of cheese into half inch cubes. Slice one onion very thin. Mix well in a soup plate. Dash with German mustard, olive oil, wine vinegar, Worcestershire sauce. Salt lightly and grind in plenty of black pepper. Then stir, preferably with a wooden spoon, so you won't mash the cheese until every hole is drenched with the dressing. Rosy Swiss Breakfast Cheese Salad Often Emmentaler is cubed in a salad for breakfast, relished especially by males on the morning after. We quote the original recipe brought over by Rosy from the Swiss Tyrol to thrill the writers and artists colony of Ridgefield, New Jersey, in her brother Emile's White House Inn. First, Rosie cut a thick slice of prime imported Emmentaler into half-inch cubes. Then she mixed imported French olive oil, German mustard, and Swiss white wine vinegar with salt and freshly ground pepper in a deep soup plate, sprinkled on a few drops of pepper sauce scattered in the chunks of Schweitzer, and stirred the cubes with a light hand, using a wooden fork and spoon to prevent bruising. The salad was ready to eat only when each and every tiny, shiny cell of the Swiss from the homeland had been washed, oiled, and polished with a soothing mixture. Drink down the juice, too, when you have finished mine breakfast cheese salad, Rosie advised the customers. It is the best cure in the world for the worst hangover. Gorgonzola and banana salad. Slice bananas lengthwise, as for a banana split. Sprinkle with lemon juice and spread with creamy gorgonzola. Sluice with French dressing, made with lemon juice in place of vinegar, to help bring out the natural banana flavor of ripe gorgonzola. Cheese and Pea Salad Cube half pound of American cheddar and mix with a can of peas, one cup of diced celery, one cup of mayonnaise, half cup of sour cream, 
and two tablespoons each of minced pimentos and sweet pickles. Serve in lettuce cups with a sprinkling of parsley and chopped radishes. Apple and cheese salad. Half cup cream cheese. One cup chopped pecans, salt and pepper, apples, sliced half inch thick, lettuce leaves, creamy salad dressing. Make tiny seasoned cheese balls, center on the apple slices standing on lettuce leaves, and sluice with creamy salad dressing. Roquefort cheese salad dressing. No cheese sauce is easier to make than the American favorite of Roquefort cheese mashed with a fork and mixed with French dressing. It is often made in a pint mason jar and kept in the refrigerator to shake up on occasion and toss over lettuce or other salads. Unfortunately, even when the Roquefort is the French import complete with a pitcher of the sheep in red and garantie veritable, the dressing is often ruined by bad vinegar and cottonseed oil, of all things. When bottled to sell in stores, all sorts of extraneous spice, oils, and mustard flour are used when nothing more is necessary than the manipulation of a fork, fine olive oil, and good vinegar, white wine, tarragon, or malt. Some ardent amateurs must have their splash of Worcestershire sauce or lemon juice with salt and pepper. This Roquefort dressing is good on all green salads, but on endive is something special. Sauce Mornay Sauce Mornay has been hailed internationally as the greatest culinary achievement in cheese. Nothing is simpler to make. All you do is prepare a white sauce, this French sauce bechamel, and add grated parmesan to your liking, stirring it in until melted and the sauce is creamy. This can be snapped up with cayenne or minced parsley, and when used with fish, a little of the cooking broth is added. Plain Cheese Sauce One part of any grated cheese to four parts of white sauce. This is a mild sauce that is nice with creamed or hard-cooked eggs. When the cheese content is doubled, two parts of cheese to four of white sauce, it is delicious on boiled cauliflower, baked potatoes, macaroni, and crackers soaked in milk. The sauce may be made richer by mixing melted butter with the flour in making the white sauce, or by beating egg yolk in with the cheese. From thin to medium to thick, it serves diverse purposes. Thin it may be used instead of milk to make tasty milk toast, sometimes spiced with curry. Medium, for baking by pouring over crackers soaked in milk. Thick, serves as a sort of Welsh rabbit when poured generously over bread toasted on one side only, with the untoasted side up to let the sauce sink in. Parsley Cheese Sauce This makes a mild, pleasantly pungent sauce to enliven the cabbage family. Hot cauliflower, Broccoli, cabbage, and Brussels sprouts. Croutons help when sprinkled over. Cornucopia of Cheese Recipes Since this is the complete book of cheese, we will fill a bounteous cornucopia here with more or less essential, if not indispensable, recipes and dishes not so easy to classify, or overlooked or crowded out of the main sections devoted to the classic fondues, rabbits, soufflés, etc. Stuffed celery, endive, anise, and other suitable stocks. Use any soft cheese you like, or firm cheese softened by pressing through a sieve at room temperature, of course, with any seasoning or relish. Suggestions. Cream cheese and chopped chives, pimentos, olives, or all three, with or without a touch of Worcestershire. Cottage cheese and piccalilli or chili sauce. Sharp cheddar mixed with mayonnaise, mustard, cream, minced capers, pickles, or minced ham. Roquefort and other blues are excellent fillings for your favorite vegetable stock or scooped out dill pickle. This last is especially nice when filled with snappy cheese creamed with sweet butter. All canapé butters are ideally suited to stuffing stocks. Pineapple cheese, especially that part close to the pineapple flavored rind, is perfect when creamed. A masterpiece in the line of filled stocks. Cut the leafy tops off an entire head of celery, endive, anise, or anything similarly suitable. Wash and separate stalks, but keep them in order to resemble in the head after each is stuffed with a different mixture, using any of the above or a tangy mix of your own concoction. After all stalks are filled, beginning with the baby center ones, press them together in the form of the original head, tie tight and chill. When ready, slice and roll about eight inch thick and arrange as a salad on a bed of watercress 
or lettuce, moistened with French dressing. Cold dunking. Besides hot dunking and Swiss fondue, cold dunking may be had by moistening plenty of cream cheese with cream or lemon in a dunking bowl. When the cheese is sufficiently liquefied, it is liberally seasoned with chopped parsley, chives, onions, pimento, and or other relish. Then a couple of tins of anchovies are macerated and stirred in, oil and all. Cheese Charlotte Line a baking dish from bottom to top with decrusted slices of bread dipped in milk. Cream one tablespoon of sweet butter with two eggs and season before stirring in two cups of grated cheese. Bake until golden brown in slow oven. Straws Roll pastry dough thin and cover with grated cheddar, fold and roll at least twice more sprinkling with cheese each time. Chill dough in the refrigerator and cut into straw-sized strips. Stiffly salt a beaten egg yolk and glaze with that to give a salty taste. Bake for several minutes until crisp. Supa Setchia Note From Cheese Cookery by Helmut Ripperger End note This is a famous cheese soup of the Engadine and little known in this country. One of its seasonings is nutmeg, and until one has used it in cheese dishes, it is hard to describe how perfectly it gives that extra something. The recipe, as given, is for each plate, but there is no reason why the old-fashioned terrine could not be used and the quantities simply increased. Put a slice of stale French bread, toasted or not, into a soup plate, and cover it with four tablespoons of grated or shredded Swiss cheese. Place another slice of bread on top of this and pour over it some boiling milk. Cover the plate and let it stand for several minutes. Season with salt, pepper, and nutmeg. Serve topped with browned hot butter. Use whole nutmeg and grate it freshly. With a cheese shaker on the table. Italians are so dependent on cheese to enrich all their dishes, from soups to spaghetti, and indeed any vegetable, that a shaker of grated parmesan, romano, or reasonable substitute, stands ready at every table, or is served freshly grated on a side dish. Thus any Italian soup might be called a cheese soup, but we know of only one, the great minestrone, in which cheese is listed as an indispensable ingredient, along with the pasta, peas, onion, tomatoes, kidney beans, celery, olive oil, garlic, oregano, potatoes, carrots, and so forth. Likewise, a chunk of melting or toasted cheese is essential in the Frito Misto, the finest mixed grill we know, and it's served up as a separate tidbit with the meats. Italians grate on more cheese for seasoning than any other people, as the French are wont to use more wine in cooking. Pfeffernus and Caraway The gingery little pepper nuts, Pfeffernus, imported from Germany in barrels at Christmas time, Make one of the best accompaniments to almost any kind of cheese. For contrast, try a dish of caraway. Diablodins Small rounds of buttered bread or toast heaped with a mound of grated cheese and browned in the oven is a French contribution. Cheese omelets Cheddar omelet Make a plain omelet your own way. When the mixture has just begun to cook, dust over it evenly half cup grated cheddar. A. Use young cheddar if you want a mild, bland omelette. B. Use sharp, aged cheddar for a full-flavored one. C. Sprinkle B. with Worcestershire sauce to make what might be called a wild omelette. Cook as usual, fold, and serve. Parmesan omelette. Mild. Cook as above, but use a quarter cup only of parmesan, grated fine, in place of the half cup cheddar. Parmesan omelette full-flavored. As above, but use half cup parmesan, finely grated as follows. Sift a quarter cup of the parmesan into your egg mixture at the beginning, and dust on the second quarter cup evenly, just as the omelet begins to set. A meal in one omelet. Fry half dozen bacon slices crisp, and keep hot while frying a cup of diced boiled potatoes in the bacon fat, to equal crispness. Meanwhile, make your omelet mixture of three eggs, beaten, and one and a half tablespoons of shredded emmentaler or domestic swiss with one tablespoon of chopped chives and salt and pepper to taste tomato and make plain omelet cover with thin rounds of fresh tomato and dust well with any grated cheese you like put under broiler 
until cheese melts to a golden brown. Omelette with cheese sauce. Make a plain French fluffy or puffy omelet, and when finished, cover with a hot, seasoned, reinforced white sauce, in which a quarter pound of cheddar cheese has been melted, and mixed well with half cup cooked diced celery and one tablespoon of pimento minced. The French use grated gruyere for this, with all sorts of sauces, such as the Savoyard de Savoy, with potatoes, chevrel, tarragon, and cream. A delicious appearance and added flavor can be had by browning with a salamander. Spanish flan, casillo, for the caramel, half cup sugar, four tablespoons water, for the flan, four eggs, beaten separately, two cups hot milk, half cup sugar, salt. Brown sugar and mix with water to make the caramel. Pour it into a baking mold. Make flan by mixing together all the ingredients. Add to caramel mold and bake in pan of water in moderate oven about three-quarter hour. Italian Frito Misto. The distinctive Italian mixed fry, Frito Misto, is made with whatever fish, sweetbreads, brains, kidneys, or tidbits of meat are at hand say a half dozen different cubes of meat and giblets, with as many hearts of artichokes, finocchi, tomato, and different vegetables as you can find, but always with a hunk of melting cheese, to fork out in golden threads with each mouthful of the mixture. Polish pirogues, a pocket full of cheese. Make noodle dough with two eggs and two cups of flour, roll out very thin, and cut into two inch squares. Cream a cupful of cottage cheese with a tablespoon of melted butter. Flavor with cinnamon and toss in a handful of seedless currants. Fill pastry squares with this and pinch edges tight together to make little pockets. Drop into a lot of fast boiling water, lightly salted, and boil steadily 30 minutes, lowering the heat so the pockets won't burst open. Drain and serve on a piping hot platter with melted butter and a sprinkling of breadcrumbs. This is a cross between ravioli and blintzes. Cheese mashed potatoes. Whip into a steaming hot dish of creamily mashed potatoes some old cheddar with melted butter and a crumbling of crisp cooked bacon. If there's a chafing dish handy, a first-rate nightcap can be made via a sautéed Swiss sandwich. Tuck a slice of Swiss cheese between two pieces of thickly buttered bread. Trim crust, cut sandwich in two, surround it with one well-beaten egg, slide it into sizzling butter, and fry on both sides. A chef at the New York Athletic Club once improved on this by first sandwiching the Swiss between a slice of ham and a slice of chicken breast, then beating up a brace of eggs with a jigger of heavy sweet cream and soaking his sandwich in this until it sopped up every drop. A final frying in sweet butter made strong men cry for it. End of chapter 9 Recording by Jennifer Stearns, Concord, New Hampshire which is chapter 10 of the complete book of cheese this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org the complete book of cheese by robert carlton brown chapter 10 appetizers crackers sandwiches savories snacks Spreads and Toasts In America, cheese got its start in country stores in our Cracker Barrel days when every man felt free to saunter in, pick up the cheese knife, and cut himself a wedge from the big-bellied rat-trap cheese standing under its glass bell or wire mesh hood that kept the flies off, but not the free lunchers cheese by itself being none too palatable the taster would saunter over to the cracker barrel shoo the cat off and help himself to the old-time crackers that can't be beat today. at that time wisconsin still belonged to the indians and vermont was our leading cheese state with its sage and cheddar and vermont country store crackers as V. Rest Orton of Weston, Vermont, calls them. When Orton heard we were writing this book, 
he sent samples from the store his father started in 1897, which is still going strong. Together with the Vermont good old-fashioned natural cheese and the sage came a handy, handmade cracker basket, all wicker, ten crackers long, and just one double cracker wide. A snug little casket for those puffy, old-time, two-in-one soda biscuits that have no salt to spoil the taste of the accompanying cheese. Each does double duty because it's made to split in the middle, so you can try one kind of cheese on one half and another on t'other, or sandwich them in between. Some Pied Piper took the country cheese and crackers to the corner saloon and led a free lunch procession that never faltered till Prohibition came. The same old store cheese was soon pepped up as saloon cheese with a saucer of caraway seeds, bowls of pickles, peppers, pickled peppers, and rye bread with plenty of mustard, pretzels or cheese straws, smear case, and schwarzbrot. Beer and cheese forever together, as in the free lunch ditty of that great day. I am an Irish hunter. I am. I ain't. I do not hunt for deer, but beer. Oh, Otto, ring the bar rag. I do not hunt for fleas, but cheese. Oh, Adolf, bring the free lunch. It was there and then that cheese came of age from coast to coast. In every bar there was a choice of Swiss, cottage, Limburger, manly cheeses, walkie-talkie oldsters that could sit up and beg, golden yellow, tangy mellow, always cut in cubes. Cheese takes the cube form as naturally as eggs take the oval, and honeycombs the hexagon. On the more elegant handout buffets, besides the shapely cubes, free Welsh rabbit started at four every afternoon to lead the tired businessman in by the nose, or a smear of Canadian snappy out of a pure white porcelain pot in the classy places on a bent's water biscuit. Sandwiches and savory snacks. Next to nibbling cheese with crackers and appetizers, of which there is no end in sight, cheese sandwiches help us consume most of our country's enormous output of brick, cheddar, and Swiss. To attempt to classify and describe all of these would be impossible, so we will content ourselves by picking a few of the cold and hot the plain, and the fancy, the familiar, and the exotic. Let's use the alphabet to sum up the situation. A. Alpine Club Sandwich Spread toast with mayonnaise, and fill with a thick slice of imported Ermenthaler. Well mustarded and seasoned, and the usual club sandwich toppings of thin slices of chicken or turkey, tomato, bacon, and a lettuce leaf. B. Boston Beanie Open Face Lightly butter a slice of Boston brown bread. Cover it generously with hot baked beans and a thick layer of shredded cheddar. Top with bacon and put under a slow broiler until cheese melts and the bacon crisps. C. Cheeseburgers Pat out some small seasoned hamburgers exceedingly thin, and, using them instead of slices of bread, sandwich in a nice slice of American cheddar, well covered with mustard. Crimp edges of the hamburgers all around to hold in the cheese, when it melts and begins to run. Toast under a brisk broiler, and serve on soft, toasted sandwich buns. D. Deviled Rye Butter flat Swedish rye bread and heat quickly in hot oven. 
cool until crisp again. Then spread thickly with cream cheese, bedeviled with ketchup, paprika, or pimiento. E. Egg, open-faced. Sauté minced small onion and small green pepper in two tablespoons of butter, and make a sauce by cooking with a cup of canned tomatoes. Season and reduce it to about half. Fry four eggs and put one in the center of each of four pieces of hot toast spread with the red sauce. Sprinkle each generously with grated cheddar. Broil until melted and serve with crisp bacon. F. French Fried Swiss Simply make a sandwich with a noble slice of imported Gruyere. Soak it in beaten egg and milk, and fry slowly till cheese melts and the sandwich is nicely browned. This is a specialty of Franche Comte. G. Grilled Chicken Ham Cheddar Cut crusts from two slices of white bread and butter them on both sides. Make a sandwich of these with one sliced cooked chicken, one half slice sharp cheddar cheese, and a sprinkling of minced ham. Fasten tight with toothpicks, cut in half, and dip thoroughly in a mixture of egg and milk. Grill golden on both sides and serve with lengthwise slices of dill pickle. H. He-Man Sandwich open-faced. Butter a thick slice of dark rye bread. Cover with a layer of mashed cold baked beans and a slice of ham. Then one of Swiss cheese and a wheel of Bermuda onion topped with mustard and a sewing of capers. I. International Sandwich. Split English muffins and toast on the hard outsides. Cover soft, untoasted insides with Swiss cheese. Spread lightly with mustard. Top that with a wheel of Bermuda onion and one or two slices of Italian-type tomato. Season with cayenne and salt. Dot with butter. Cover with Brazil nuts and brown under the broiler. J. Jurassiennes or Croute Comtoise. Soak slices of stale buns in milk. Cover with a mixture of onion browned in chopped lean bacon and mixed with grated gruyere. Simmer until cheese melts and serve. K. Kumulkas. If you like caraway flavor, this is your sandwich. On well-buttered but lightly mustarded rye, lay a thickish slab of Milwaukee kumakas which translates caraway cheese. For good measure, sprinkle caraway seeds on top, or serve them in a saucer on the side. Then dash on a splash of cumul, the caraway liqueur that's best when imported. L. Limburger onion or Limburger ketchup. Marinate slices of Bermuda onion in a peppery French dressing for one half hour. Then, butter slices of rye, spread well with soft Limburger, top with onion, and you will have something super duper, if you like Limburger. When ketchup is substituted for marinated onion, the sandwich has quite another character and flavor. So, true Limburger addicts make one of each, and take alternate bites, for the thrill of contrast. M. Meringue, open-faced. From the Browns, 10,000 snacks. Allow one egg and four tablespoons of grated cheese to one slice of bread. Toast bread on one side only. Spread butter on untoasted side. Put two tablespoons grated cheese over butter and the yolk of an egg in the center. Beat egg white, stiff with a few grains of salt, and pile lightly on top. Sprinkle the other two tablespoons of grated cheese 
over that, and bake in a moderate oven until the egg white is firm and the cheese has melted to a golden brown. N. Neuf Chatel and Honey We know no sandwich more ethereal than one made with thin, decrusted white bread spread with sweet butter, then with Neufchatel, topped with some fine honey, Mount Hymetus, if possible. Any creamy petite Suisse will do as well as the Neufchatel, but nothing will take the place of the honey to make this heavenly sandwich that must have been the original Ambrosia. O. Oh, Oscar's Ham Cam Oscar Davidson of Copenhagen, whose five-foot menu lists 186 superb sandwiches and snacks, each with a character all its own, perfected the ham cam base for a flock of fancy ham sandwiches, open-faced on rye or white, soft or crisp, sweet or sour, almost any one-way slice you desire. He uses as many contrasting kinds of bread as possible, and his butter varies from salt to fresh and whipped. The ham cam base involves a juicy, tender slice of freshly boiled, mild-cured ham, with imported camembert spread on the ham as thick as velvet. The ham cam is built up with such splendors as goose liver paste and madeira wine jelly fried calves kidney and roumelade bombay curry salad bird's liver and fried egg a slice of red roast beef and more of that red madeira jelly with anything else you say just as long as it does credit to camembert on ham P. Pickled Camembert Butter a thin slice of rye or pumpernickel and spread with ripe imported camembert. When in season, which isn't summer, make a mixture of sweet, sour, and dill pickles, finely chopped, and spread it on top. Top this with a thin slice of white bread for pleasing contrast with the black. Q. Queijo da Serra Sandwich On generous rounds of French flute or other crunchy, crusty white bread, place thick portions of any good Portuguese cheese made of sheep's milk in the mountains. This last translates back into Queijo da Serra, the fattest, finest cheese in the world, on a par with fine Greek feta, Bead the open-faced creamy cheese lightly with imported capers, and you'll say it's scrumptious. R. Roquefort Nut Butter hot toast and cover with a thickish slice of genuine Roquefort cheese. Sprinkle thickly with genuine Hungarian paprika. Put in moderate oven for about six minutes. Finish it off with chopped pine nuts, almonds, or a mixture thereof. S. Smoky Sandwich and Sturgeon Smoked Sandwich Skin some juicy little, jolly little sprats, lay on thin rye, or a slice of miniature loaf rye, studded with caraway, spread with sweet butter, and cover with a slice of smoked cheese. Hickory is preferred for most of the smoking in America. In New York, the best smoked cheese, whether from Canada or nearer home, is usually cured in the same room with sturgeon. Since this king of smoked fish imparts some of its regal flavor to the cheddar, there is a natural affinity peculiarly suited to sandwiching as above. Smoked salmon, eel, whitefish, or any other, is also good with cheese smoked with hickory, or anything with a salubrious savor, while a sandwich of smoked turkey with smoked cheese is out of this world. We accompany it with a cup of smoky Lapsang Suchong China tea. T. 
tea. Tangy sandwich. On buttered rye spread cream cheese, and on this bed lay thinly sliced dried beef. In place of mustard, dot the beef with horseradish and pearl onions, or those reliable old chopped chives. And, by the way, if you must use mustard on every cheese sandwich, try different kinds for a change. Sharp English, freshly mixed by your own hand, out of the tin of powder, or Dijon, for a French touch. You. Unusual sandwich of flowers, hay, and clover. On a sweet buttered slice of French white bread, lay a layer of equally sweet English flour cheese, made with petals of rose, marigold, violet, etc., and top that with French fromage de foin. This French hay cheese gets its name from being ripened on hay, and holds its new mown scent. Sprinkle on a few imported capers, the smaller they are, the better, with a little of the luscious lime, and dust lightly with sapsogo. Fee. Vegetarian sandwich. Roll your own of alternate leaves of lettuce, slices of store cheese, avocados, cream cheese sprinkled heavily with chopped chives, and anything else in the vegetable or cassius kingdoms that suits your fancy. W. Witch's Sandwich. Butter two slices of sandwich bread, cover one with a thin slice of imported Emmentaler, dash with cayenne, and a drop or two of Tabasco. Slap on a sizzling hot slice of grilled ham, and press it together with the cheese between the two bread slices. Put in a hot oven, and serve piping hot, with a handful of moonstones, those outsize pearl onions. X. Show Chomico Sandwich. In spite of the milko in Show Chomico, there isn't a drop to be had that's native to the festive floating gardens near Mexico City. For there, instead of the cow, a sort of century plant gives milky white pulque, the fermented juice of this cactus-like desert plant. With this goes a vegetable cheese, curded by its own vegetable rennet. It's called tuna cheese, made from the milky juice of the prickly pear that grows on yet another cactus-like plant of the dry lands. This tuna cheese sometimes teams up in arid lands with the juicy, thick cactus leaf, sliced into a tortilla sandwich. The milky pulque of Xochomilco goes as well with it as beer with a Swiss cheese sandwich. Why, yolk picnic sandwich. Hard-cooked egg yolk worked into a yellow paste with cream cheese, mustard, olive oil, lemon juice, celery salt, and a touch of Tabasco spread on thick slices of whole wheat bread. Z. Zebra. Take a tip from Oscar over in Copenhagen and design your own zebra sandwich as decoratively as one of those oft-photoed skins in El Morocco. Just alternate stripes of black bread with various white cheeses in between, to follow the black and white zebra pattern. For good measure, we will toss in a couple of toasted cheese sandwiches. Toasted Cheese Sandwich Butter both sides of two thick slices of white bread, and sandwich between them a seasoned mixture of shredded sharp cheese, egg yolk, mustard, and chopped chives, together with stiffly beaten egg white, folded in last to make a light filling. Fry the buttered sandwich in more butter until well melted and nicely gilded. This toasted cheeser is so good, it's positively sinful. 
the French, who outdo us in both cooking and sin, make one of their own in the form of fried fingers of stale bread, doused in an arf and arf Welsh rabbit, and fondue melting of gruyere, that serves as a liaison to further sandwich the two. Garlic is often used in place of chopped chives, and in contrast to this wild one, there's a mild one made of Dutch cream cheese by the equally Dutch Pennsylvanians. England, of course, together with Wales, holds all-time honors with such celebrated regional toasting cheeses as Devonshire and Dunlop. Even British Newfoundland is known for its simple version that's quite as pleasing as its rich Prince Edward Island oyster stew. Newfoundland Toasted Cheese Sandwich One pound grated cheddar, one egg well beaten, one half cup milk, one tablespoon butter. Heat together and pour over well buttered toast. End of section 12, which is chapter 10 of the complete book of cheeses. Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox. LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lawrence. The Complete Book of Cheese by Robert Carlton Brown. Chapter 11. Fit for Drink. A country without a fit drink for cheese has no cheese fit for drink. Greece was the first country to prove its Epicurean fitness, according to the old saying above, for it had wine to tipple and sheep's milk cheese to nibble. The classical Greek cheese has always been feta, and no doubt this was the kind that Circe combined most suitably with wine to make a farewell drink for her lovers. She put further sweetness and body into the stirrup cup by stirring honey and barley meal into it. Today we might whip this up in an electric mixer to toast her memory. While a land flowing with milk and honey is the ideal of many, France, Italy, Spain, or Portugal, flowing with wine and honey, suit a lot of gourmets better. Indeed, in such vinous caseous places, cheese is on the house at all wine sales for prospective customers to snack upon, and thus bring out the full flavor of the cellared vintages. But professional wine tasters are forbidden any cheese between sips. They may clear their palates with plain bread, but nary a crumb of Roqueford or cube of Gruyere in working hours, lest it give the wine a spurious nobility. And, speaking of Roqueford, Romanet has the closest affinity for it. Such affinities are also found in pont Levesque and Beaujolais, Brie and Red Champagne, Cumlamier and any other good vin de rosé. Heavenly marriages are made in Burgundy between red and white wines of both Cote, Dunouy, and de Bona, and Burgundian cheeses such as Epois, Sommaterrain, and saint florentin Pomenard, and Port Salut, seem to be made for each other, as do Chateau Margaux and Camembert. A great cheese for a great wine is the rule that brings together in the neighboring provinces such notables as Samoir, Valence, Badam, and the Loire wines, Vouvray, Samour, and Anjou. Gruyère mates with Chablis, Camembert with saint Emilion, and any dry red wine, most commonly Claret, is a fit drink for the hundreds of other fine French cheeses. Every country has such happy marriages, an Italian standard being Provolone and Chianti. Then there is a most unusual pair, French Neufchatel cheese and Swiss Neuchatel wine from just across the border. Switzerland also has another cheese favorite at home, Tabin, grape cheese, named from the Neuchatel wine in which it is aged. One kind of French Neufchatel cheese, Vendant, 
is also uniquely suited to the company of any good wine because it is made in the exact shape and size of a wine barrel bung. A similar relation is found in Brinzaz, or Brindzaz, that are packed in miniature wine barrels, strongly suggesting what should be drunk with such excellent cheeses, Hungarian Toke. Other foreign cheeses go to market wrapped in vine leaves. The affinity has clearly been laid down in heaven. Only the English seem to have a fortissimo taste in the go-with wines, according to these matches registered by André Simon in The Art of Good Living. Red Cheshire with light tawny port, white Cheshire with Oloroso sherry, blue Leicester with old vintage port, green Roqueford with new vintage port. To these we might add brittle chips of Greek Césaire with nips of Amontillado for an eloquent appetizer. The English also pour port into Stilton and sundry other wines and liquors into Cheddars and such. This doctoring leads to fraudulent imitation, however, for either port or stout is put into counterfeit Cheshire cheese to make up for the richness it lacks. While some combinations of cheeses and wines may turn out palatable, we prefer taking ours straight. When something more fiery is needed, we can twirl the flecks of pure gold in a chalice of eau de vie de Danzig and nibble on legitimate Danzig cheese unadulterated. Goldwasser, or eau de vie, was a favorite liqueur of cheese-loving Franklin Roosevelt, and we can be sure he took the two separately. Another perfect combination, if you can take it, is imported Kamel, with any caraway-seeded cheese or cream cheese with a handy saucer of caraway seeds. In the section of France devoted to gin, the juniper berries that flavor the drink also go into a local cheese, fromage port. This is further fortified with brandy, white wine, and pepper. One regional tipple with such brutally strong cheese is black coffee laced with gin. French La Jeanne is another potted thriller with not only coffee and rum mixed in during the making, but orange flower water too. Then there is La Petrofina, made with brandy and absinthe, Haysbrook with brandy alone, and La Cacha with white wine and brandy. In Italy, white gorgonzola is also put up in crocks with brandy. In Oporto, the sharp cheese of that name is enlivened by port. Cider and the greatest of apple jacks, Cavendose, seem made to go with the regional Cavendose cheese. This is also true of our native Jersey Lightning and hard cider with their accompanying New York State cheese. In the Ogue Valley of France, farmers also drink homemade cider with their own Oglo, a piquant kind of Pont l'Eveque. The English sip pear cider, Perry, with almost any British cheese. Milk would seem to be redundant, but sage cheese and buttermilk do go well together. Wine and cheese have other things in common. Some wines and some cheeses are aged in caves, and there are vintage cheeses, no less than vintage wines, as in the case with Stilton. End of chapter 11 Recording by David Lawrence In Brampton, Ontario, August 2009of the complete book of cheese this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ruth golding the complete book of cheese by robert carlton brown chapter 12 lazy lou once so goes the sad story there was a cheesemonger unworthy of his heritage. He exported a shipload of inferior Swiss made somewhere in the USA. Bad to begin with, it had worsened on the voyage. Rejected by the health authorities on the other side, it was shipped back, reaching home in the unhappy condition known as cracked. To cut his losses, the rascally cheesemonger had his cargo ground up and its flavour disguised with hot peppers and chilli sauce. Thus there came into being the abortion known as the cheese spread. The cheese spread, or food, and its cousin, the processed cheese, are handy, cheap, 
and nasty. They are available everywhere, and some people even like them. So any cheese book is bound to take formal notice of their existence. I have done so, and now an unfond farewell to them. My academic cheese education began at the University of Wisconsin in 1904. I grew up with our great Midwest industry. I have read with profit hundreds of pamphlets put out by the learned Aggies of my alma mater. Mostly they treat of honest, natural cheeses, the making, keeping, and enjoying of authentic longhorn cheddars, short bricks, and naturalized Limburgers. At the School of Agriculture the students still, I am told, keep their hand in by studying the classical layout on a cheese board. One booklet recommends the following for freshman contemplation. Caraway Brick, Select Brick, Edam, Wisconsin Swiss, Longhorn American, Shefford. These six sturdy samples of Wisconsin's best will stimulate any amount of classroom discussion. Does the Edam go better with German-American black bread, or with Swedish rye crisp? To butter or not to butter? And if to butter, with which cheese? Salt or sweet? How close do we come to the excellence of the genuine Alpine Swiss? Primary school stuff, but not unworthy of thought. Pass on down the years. You are now ready to graduate. Your cheese board can stand a more sophisticated setup. Try two boards, play the teams against each other. The All American Champs, New York Coon, Philadelphia Cream, Ohio Liederkranz, Vermont Sage, Kentucky Trappist, Wisconsin Limburger, California Jack, Pineapple, Minnesota Blue, Brick, Tillamook. Versus the European Giants, Portuguese Trazos Montes, Dutch Gouda, Italian Parmesan, Yugoslavian Kakavai, French Roquefort, Swiss Emmentaler, English Stilton, Danish Blue, German Münster, Greek Feta, Hable. The postgraduate may play the game using as counters the great and distinctive cheeses of more than fifty countries. Your Scandinavian board alone, just to give an idea of the riches available, will shine with blues, yellows, whites, smoky browns and chocolates, representing Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, Iceland and Lapland. For the Britisher, only blue-veined Stilton is worthy to crown the banquet. The Frenchman defends Roquefort, the Dane his own regal blue. The Swiss sticks to Emmentaler before, during, and after all three meals. You may prefer to finish with a delicate brie, a smoky slice of provolone, a bit of baby gouda, or some Liptauer garniert, about which more later. We load them all on Lazy Lou. Lazy Susan's big twin brother, a giant roulette wheel of cheese, every number a winner. A second Lazy Lou will bear the savouries and go-withs. For these titbits the English have a divine genius. Think of the deviled shrimps, smoked oysters, herring roe on toast, snips of broiled sausage. But we will make do with some olives and radishes, a few pickles, nuts, capers. With our two trusty lazy loos on hand, plus wine or beer, we can easily dispense with the mere dinner itself. Perhaps it is an Italian night. Then lazy Lou is happily burdened with imported latticini, in canestrato, still bearing the imprint of its wicker basket, pepato, which is but in canestrato peppered, Melfina, deep yellow buttery scanno with its slightly burned flavour, tangy asiago, cacio cavallo, 
so called because the two cheeses, tied in pairs and hung over a pole, look as though they were sitting in a saddle. Cheese on horseback, or caccio a cavallo. Then we ring in Lazy Lou's first assistant, an old silver-plated revolving Florentine magnum holder. It's designed to spin a gigantic flask of Chianti. The flick of a finger and the bottle is before you. Gently pull it down and hold your glass to the spout. True imported wines and cheeses are expensive, but native American products and reasonably edible imitations of the real thing are available as substitutes. Anyway, protein for protein, a cheese party will cost less than a steak barbecue, and it can be more fun. Encourage your guests to contribute their own latest discoveries. One may bring along as his ticket of admission a primavera from Brazil. Another some cubes of an Andean specialty just flown in from Colombia's mountain city Merida, and still wrapped in its aromatic leaves of Frelejon la Nuzo. Another a few wedges of savoury sweet English flower cheese, some flavoured with rose petals, others with marigolds. Another a tube of South American Kräuterkäse. Provide your own assortment of breads, and try to include some of those fat, flaky, old-fashioned crackers that country stores in New England can still supply. Mustard? Sure, if you like it. If you want to be fancy, Use a tricky little gadget put out by the Mai condiment makers in France and available here in the food specialty shops. It's a miniature painter's palette holding five mustards of different shades and flavours and two mustard paddles. The mustards, in proper chromatic order, are jonquil yellow strong Dijon, green herbs, brownish tarragon, golden aura, crimson, tomato-flavoured. And just to keep things moving, we have restored an antique whirling cruet holder to deliver Worcestershire sauce, soy sauce, A1, tap sauce, and Major Gray's chutney. Salt shakers and pepper mills are handy, with a big hold tin canister filled with crushed red pepper pods, chilli powder, Hungarian paprika, and such small matters. Butter, both sweet and salt, is on hand, together with saucers or bowls of curry, capers, chives, sliced, not chopped, minced onion, fresh mint leaves, chopped pimientos, caraway, quartered lemons, parsley, fresh tarragon, tomato slices, red and white radishes, green and black olives, pearl onions, and assorted nut meats. Some years ago, when I was collaborating with my mother Cora and my wife Rose in writing Ten Thousand Snacks, which, by the way, devotes nearly forty pages to cheeses, we staged a rather elaborate tasting party just for the three of us. It took a two-tiered lazy loo to twirl the load. The eight wedges on the top round were English and French samples, and the lower one carried the rest as follows. English cheddar, Cheshire, English Stilton, Canadian cheddar, rum-flavoured, French Münster, French Brie, French Camembert, French Roquefort, Swiss Sapsago, Swiss Gruyère, Swiss Edam, Dutch Gouda, Italian Provolone, Czech Ostiepki, Italian Gorgonzola, Norwegian Getost, Hungarian Liptauer. The tasting began with familiar English Cheddars, Cheshires and Stiltons from the top row. We had cheese knives, scoops, graters, scrapers and a regulation wire saw, but for this line of crumbly Britishers, fingers were best. The Cheddar was a light lemony yellow, almost white, like our best domestic bar cheese of old. The Cheshire was mouldy and milky, 
with a slightly fermented flavour that brought up the musty dining-room of Fleet Street's Cheshire cheese and called for draughts of beer. The Stilton was strong but mellow, as high in flavour as in price. Only the rum-flavoured Canadian cheddar from Montreal, by courtesy English, let us down. It was done up as fancy as a bridegroom in waxed white paper, and looked as smooth and glossy as a gardenia. But there its beauty ended. Either the rum that flavoured it wasn't up to much, or the mixture hadn't been allowed to ripen naturally. The French Münster, however, was hearty, cheery, and better made than most German Münster, which at that time wasn't being exported much by the Nazis. The brie was melting prime. The camembert was so perfectly matured we ate every scrap of the crust, which can't be done with many American camembert, or, indeed, with the dead, dry French ones sold out of season. Then came the Roquefort, a regal cheese we voted the best buy of the lot, even though it was the most expensive. A plump piece, pleasantly unctuous but not greasy, sharp in scent, stimulatingly bittersweet in taste, unbeatable. There is no American pretender to the Roquefort throne. Ours is invariably chalky and tasteless. That doesn't mean we have no good blues. We have, but they are not Roquefort. The Sapsago, or Kräuterkäse, from Switzerland, it has been made in the canton of Glarus for over five hundred years, was the least expensive of the lot. Well cured and dry, it lent itself to grating, and tasted fine on an old-fashioned buttered soda cracker. Sapsago has its own seduction, derived from the clover-leaf powder with which the curd is mixed, and which gives it its haunting flavour and spring-like sage-green colour. Next came some truly great Swiss gruyère, delicately rich, and nutty enough to make us think of the sharp white wines to be drunk with it at the sauce. As for the provolone, notable for the water-buffalo milk that makes it, there's an example of really grown-up milk. Perfumed as spring flowers drenched with a shower of Anjou, having a bouquet all its own, and a trace of a wine-like kick, it made us vow never to taste another American imitation. Only a smooth-cheeked, thick slab cut from a pedigreed Italian provolone of medium girth, all in one piece, and with no sign of a crack, satisfy the gourmet. The second Italian classic was gorgonzola, gorgeous gorgonzola, as fruity as apples, peaches and pears sliced together. It smells so much like a ripe banana we often eat them together, plain or with the crumbly formaggio lightly forked into the fruit, split lengthwise. After that, the Edam tasted too lipsticky, like the red paint job on its rind, and the Gouda seemed only half-hearted. Both too obviously ready-made for commerce, with nothing individual or custom-made about them, rolled or bounced over from Holland by the boatload. The Ostiepki from Czechoslovakia might have been a link of smoked ostrich sausage put up in the skin of its own red neck. In spite of its pleasing lemon-yellow interior, we couldn't think of any use for it except maybe crumbling thirty or forty cents worth into a ten-cent bowl of bean soup. So we set it aside to try in tiny chunks on crackers as an appetizer some other day, when it might be more appetizing. We felt much the same about the chocolate-brown Norwegian getost that looked like a slab of boarding-school fudge, and which had the same cloying cling to the tongue. We were told by a native that our piece was entirely too young. That's what made it so insipid, undeveloped in texture and flavour. 
but the next piece we got turned out to be too old and decrepit, and so strong it would have taken a Paul Bunyan to stand up under it. When we complained to our expert about the shock to our palates, he only laughed, pointing to the nail on his little finger. You should take just a little bit like that, a pill no bigger than a couple of aspirins or an Alka-Seltzer. It's only in the morning you take it when it's old and strong like this for a pick-me-up, a cure for a hangover, you know, like a prairie oyster well soused in Worcestershire. That made us think we might use it up to flavour a Welsh rabbit instead of the Worcestershire sauce, but we couldn't melt it with anything less than a blowtorch. To bring the party to a happy end, we went to town on the Hungarian lip tower, garnishing that fine, granulating, buttery base after mixing it well with some cream cheese. We mixed the mixed cheese with sardine and tuna mashed together in a little of the oil from the can. We juiced it with lemon, sluiced it with bottled sauces, worked in the leftovers, some tarragon, mint, spicy seeds, parsley, capers, and chives. We peppered it and paprikaed it, salted and spiced it, then spread it thicker than butter on pumpernickel and went to it. That's Liptower Garniert. End of chapter 12